today I want to talk about the parables, the parable of the miners. Uh, uh, and another translation in the Bible, there is the parable of the servants, of the parable of the pound. Uh, in my translation, and the parable of the, the miners. And now we know it's, a palm, it's palm Sunday, and, any, and kind of anyone wants to hear the story of the Palm Sunday. But actually, this parable that Jesus told is right before Jesus enters Jerusalem. So it's very important we look at this parable together and see the context of, the, of this. Because uh, in, verse, uh, in Luke chapter 19, verse 11, uh, kind of Jesus gives the, the context of what, what happened. So open your Bible in, in Luke chapter 19. Yeah? And when you, are say they, when you are there, say I. Luke chapter 19. Wow, you're so fast. I mean, I think you have a gadget. Click there. Yes? For those who have electronics, don't turn. Just click. Click on Luke, <laughs> Luke 19. Yeah, Luke 19, Luke 19, verse 11. The crowd was listening to every, everything Jesus said. And because he was nearing Jerusalem, he told them a story to correct the impression that the kingdom of God would begin right away. So that's the point. Yeah, that Jesus starts this, this parable. And, and with this parable, he goes into Jerusalem, and everybody is waiting for him, and, uh, and everybody is rejoicing with him. But... With that in mind, that still people have the misconception, the wrong idea about uh, uh, Jesus ent entering in, in Jerusalem. Yeah? Um, it's very important to look at this story because Jesus corrects the misunderstanding they have. Uh, because they had this in mind, you know, that so finally one day their Messiah will come and will free them from oppression of Rome and establish the kingdom of God. And when Jesus enters to Jerusalem, they have the same, the same mindset. And that's why Jesus tried to warn them ahead, this is actually what's going to happen. And with this in mind, he tells a story. Yeah, we're going to read from verse 12. Luke chapter 19, verse 12. And he said, A noble man was called away to a distant empire to be crowned king and then return. Before he left, he called together ten of his servants and divided among them ten pounds of silver, saying, Invest this for me while I am gone. But his people hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, We do not want, the, we do not want him to be our king. And after he, crowned, after he was crowned king, he returned and called in the servants to whom he had given the money. He wanted to find out what their profit were. The first servant reported, Master, I invested your money and made ten times the original amount. Well done, the king exclaimed. You are a good servant. You have been faithful with the leader and I entrust, to you, I entrust it to you so you will be governor of ten city as your reward. The next servant reported, Master, I invested your money and made five times the original amount. Well done, the king said. You will be governor over five cities. But the third servant brought back only the original amount of the money uh, and said, Master, I hid your money and kept it safe. And I was afraid because you are a hard man to deal with, Talk, t taking what is yours and harvesting crops you didn't plant. You wicked servant, the king roared, your own words condemn you. If you knew that I am a hard man who takes what isn't mine and harvests crops and I didn't plant, why did you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have, had, I have gotten some, some interest on it. Then turning to the others standing nearby, the king ordered, Take the money from the servant and give it to the one who has ten pounds. But the master, the master then said, He already has ten pounds. Yes, the king replied, And those who, who, who use it well, what they are given, even more will be given. But from those who do nothing, even what is little they have will be taken away. And for, the, for, the, for, for these enemies of mine, who didn't want me to be their king, bring them in and execute them right here in front of me. We'll stop here with the, with the reading. So we have this, this parable of the, of the pound, of the miners, that deals with, uh, with two categories of, of, of people. They are servants and enemies. Yeah? We have the three servants, and that talks about the enemies in the beginning and in the end. And, and you are one of these. You are in one of these categories. And we're going to see in the end which one you are, right? So servants and enemies. And Jesus was on, on his final trip to Jerusalem, 
and, and, and would soon enter uh, to the city on, on Palm Sunday. And he had to pass through the, uh, just a little bit of context here, he had to pass through to the city of Jericho on his way to Jerusalem. And, uh, and in, in chapter 18, Jesus uh, uh, encounters a blind man and who is not only healed physically, but also he is saved spiritually. Then we have in Luke chapter 19, the first 10 verses, uh, Jesus encounters uh, Zacchaeus, yeah, who is also saved and having stayed at his house. So the closer Jesus gets to Jerusalem, the greater is the excitement and anticipation that he was about to set his, uh, his physical kingdom immediately. Uh, because that was a prophecy. That was everybody knew that you know, one day the Messiah will come and, and physically will be established the kingdom of God here on earth. But the disciples did not understand that Jesus was about to depart from, from this earth and go to a, a far country, yeah, in heaven, a far country where God the Father would crown him as a king and give him the kingdom, the kingdom of God. So the parable here is not about economics, but it's about the kingship. Yeah, the kingship. And we have here in the story that a noble man goes away to receive a kingdom, yeah, and his suitability for this role is kind of challenged by his citizens, and, and in, verse, uh, in verse 12 says that, that he was hating him. Everybody was hating him. And, and, and during his absence, uh, he left an equal sum of money uh, which, with each ten of the servants, instructing them to engage in business while he's gone. And meanwhile, the citizens uh, instigates a rebellion in an effort to depose him. But on his return of this noble man, After he received the kingdom, he first called his servants to give a report of their business with, uh, with his money. And we have here in the story, the faithful servants are rewarded and, and delegated with authority over cities. And then we have an unfaithful servant who is kind of cursed in the end. Yeah? And the parable concludes with the, with the slaughter of the king's enemy. Yeah? We have the enemies in the beginning who kind of doesn't want him to be a king, but in the end... We, we, see, uh, we see in verse 27 that the, the parable concludes with the slaughter of king's enemy. And, uh, and then it's followed by the account of Jesus' uh, entry in, Jer in Jerusalem as a king. Yeah, for, for, those, for those people. Now, it's very important that this parable is, uh, is not to be confused with the parable that is recorded in Matthew 25. The parable of the talents. Yeah? It's in, in that in, in there, there are similarities in, in from both bo both parables, but also there are significant differences. In the parable of the talents, the master of the servants divide, divides up his wealth among three servants, yeah, and each servant receives a different amount based on their abilities, yeah. In this parable, the, the parable of the miners, the power of the pound, there are ten servants, and all of them receive an identical amount. Yeah? And they are charged to, in, uh, uh, to engage in business while this nobleman is gone. Yeah? And the parable of the talents points to, to the variety of gifts that God entrusts to his servants. But in this parable, each servant receives the same amount. It's not different, the same amount. Therefore, uh, it's a, a, uh, this parable is in view of uh, equality of opportunities for each of the servants of Christ. So each one of the servants received the same opportunity. Equal opportunity. It's not different, it's equal opportunity. Each servant of Jesus has precisely the same opportunity to advance his cause. And of course, Jesus identifies himself as a king, yeah? He's coming to this world, and I'm about to go to die on the cross, yeah? And then I'm going to uh, rise again, and I'll go to the Father where I receive my kingdom, yeah? I receive what is mine, and then I will come back. So that's the idea that Jesus mentions in this parable. So the whole, the whole idea is, what, what's, so what do we learn from, from this parable? Um, 
because I, I think I'll probably multiple lessons uh, uh, that they probably can uh, uh, learn from this parable. But I want to focus on a few applications uh, from this parable and see immediate value to us as Christians in 21st century and um, regarding the, the kingdom of God. So number one, there is going to be a king. There is going to be a king. Yeah? Jesus tells this parable immediately before going to Jerusalem where he is, is, is going to be crowned. And, and in Luke chapter 9, 1938, it says, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And everybody receives as a king. Yeah? But soon these people are going to reject him. Yeah? And Jesus has spoken repeatedly about the, what's going to happen to him when he got to Jerusalem. But, but listeners usually don't pay attention, like happens in the church. Yeah? People don't pay attention to what's been said. Yeah? Or they don't want to hear. Yeah? But Jesus repeatedly mentioned that I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm not going to be a king. I'm going to die. But one day, I'm going to come back as a king. Today is going to be a king. And Jesus took this, the 12 disciples aside and tells them, you know, I'm going to Jerusalem. Yeah? And, and, uh, and it's written for me because the Son of Man has to go to Jerusalem to, to fulfill this prophecy. And, and then they will mock him, they will insult him, they will spit on him, they will, they will, they will crucify him and kill him. But on the third day, I'm going to rise again. So it's very clear from the gospel as account that the, the people in general, and the disciples in particular, hope that the kind of Jesus, you know, Jesus' journey to Jer Jerusalem will end up in, a, in, a, in some kind of a, a massacre, fighting against the Roman Empire, and finally to establish the kingdom of God. And that was the, the kingdom of God they wanted. Um, when they wanted we know the reality was going to be different. In the story here, we have this noble man who goes in a distant country in order to have himself appointed as a king. And the same with Jesus. He's going away for a while to be appointed by the Father to be the king. To receive what belongs to him. The kingdom of God, the kingship that he deserves it. So what's the application for us? There's going to be a king. But we have to live it, our life with expectations. Live your life with expectation. For, for them, it wasn't yet the king. Yeah? Jesus died. He, came not, he didn't come as a king. He came to die. Jesus came, says, first to seek, in, 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 verse, in, in chapter 18... In the last verse, and it says, I came to seek and save what is lost. So first Jesus came to seek and save what is lost. Jesus came first not as a king. But they received him as a king on a Palm Sunday. But in the end it ended up the way it was planned. By God's plan, by God's sovereignty. To die on the cross so the lost can be saved and found. But when Jesus comes back, based on the Bible, when Jesus comes back, he has a different purpose. The kingdom of heaven, it's, it's, it's a present reality, it's now, and it's also a future reality. Yeah? So the kingdom started with him when he started the ministry. But there's going to be a future reign that needs to be taken by Jesus. And that day is going to be. When Jesus will come, he comes as a king with a different purpose. So we have to live with that expectation that one day the king is coming. One day the king is coming. Here's number two. The works of God continues. Yeah? The works of God, it didn't stop with Christ on the, on the cross, uh, with Christ going up in heaven. The works of God continues. In the parable, in verse 13, says the noble man called the ten of his servants and gave them ten, ten minas. Yeah? And says, put this money to work, he, says, he told them, until I come back. So, so while Jesus is absent, the Bible says that his true servants will be the ones who carry out the mission of Jesus. Yeah? He just said, I have finished the work that my father gave to me, now it's your turn. 
And while I am, uh, while I'm gone, it's your duty to continue the work of the kingdom. The original meaning says, "Keep being occupied until I return." Keep being occup occupied yourself with, with the work of the kingdom until I return. So God, God's work continues with us. And the power of the talents, the, the servants receive different amounts of wealth according to their abilities. But in this parable, we all receive the same amount. We all receive the same opportunity every single day. We receive equally opportunities and it's our duty while the king the future king is gone it's our duty to carry that opportunity to fulfill that opportunity each servant of jesus has precisely the same opportunity to advance the kingdom of god each christian has the identical opportunity to serve christ and to extend the kingdom of god let's not make differences anymore Leaders and pastors and elders and ministry leaders, they have different opportunities that we have. Based on the word of God, we all have the same opportunity to extend the kingdom of God. And it's our role, it's our calling to fulfill that work of Christ until he comes back. You exist, you and me exist here with the mission to expand the kingdom of God while the master is the way. Jesus came once, and you'll come again. But in between, there is work to do. There is work to do, people. And the king invested in us. The king gave us opportunity. And your mission, and my mission, and your living, and my living is about the kingdom. It's about the kingdom of God. We are not called simply to sit back and wait for the kingdom to come because there is work to do. God calls you and calls me to be faithful. He doesn't call us to be successful. He calls us to be faithful with the opportunity that rises in our path or every single day. It's not about the size of your ministry that pleases God. It's not about the, the size and the scope of your ministry here on earth that determines the pleasure of Jesus in you. But your faithful obedience, your commitment to what God gave you while he's gone. This is what makes Jesus to, have, to, to be pleased with you. He doesn't call you to be someone that you are not. He doesn't call you to do something he hasn't gifted to you. He's calling you to be faithful with what you have. Each one of us receives something. And we are, we are called to be faithful with what we have. And here's the third thing. There's a, there's a great blessing if we fulfill the mission. We have here two, two servants, an example. Two servants that um, comes the, the master and, and said, yes, I, I, I invested your, your money and and there's going to be a blessing for them. And now it's interesting that when we read this story, we kind of um, we kind of thinking, wow, you know, if I work for Jesus, I get stuff, yeah. You now because I did that for Jesus, and Jesus gives me back something in return, yeah. So this is the mentality. Wow, if I work for Jesus, I get a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. And 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 I look at these guys and. And these guys worked, worked hard. Was, worked, they worked very, very hard. And, and in response, the master gives to one of them more work. Right? It, it says to the, the first one, you've been faithful, you know, govern ten city. I mean, govern means work. Yeah? It doesn't mean you sit back on chairs and, you know, and, you, and you watch. It means work. And then in the end, with the guy who's not faithful, he takes away from him and he gives it to, the, to, to another guy extra work. Yeah? So I'm thinking, so how on earth is a blessing for him? Because he gets an extra work for the guys he didn't do his job. Look here, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11. Yes, you will be enriched in every way. So that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. 
when you work, when you give, God will give you more. Your work will be a blessing to others. So that why, and that's why Jesus is giving you more. Because you are blessed to be a blessing. And, and, and when we have more, we can bless more people. So you see how, how, how this blessing actually turns into your favor. Because you are blessed, so other people are blessed through you. And when you give, God gives you more. So you can give more. So you can bless more. This is not a punishment, but a blessing. Because he knows your work will bless others. And if you work harder, God will give you extra work. Because your work will bless other people too. What you've done here on earth, how faithful you were here on earth, will determine the kind of reward you'll receive from God. So we have a king. We, we received orders for him to, to work while he's gone. And there's going to be a blessing if we obey these orders. But there's going to be also a curse if we don't. We have the servant who didn't do his job. And here's the, the next one. Number four. Evil always loses. We can call him loser. Yeah? Always loses. We always have a happy ending. Right? The evil always loses. How many films you've seen and actually the evil won? Never. All the films in cinema, the evil always loses. The king's enemy Though apparently triumphant now, one day, when they will meet the king, their punishment will be very hard. They will lose very badly. Look verse 27. And as far for these enemies of mine, who didn't want me to be their king, how many people doesn't want Jesus to be their king? Today. How many times we reject Jesus today? We don't want him to be the king. And he says, bring them and execute them right here in front of me. That will be the judgment day. They will always lose. In this parable, the nobleman uh, subjects hated him you know, and sent a delegation you know, saying uh, in verse 14, we don't want him to be our king. Yeah? But then when, when the king returns, when the nobleman returns as a king, the enemies will be killed. They always lose us. So this represents those who oppose Christ. Before and after his ascensions. Those who doesn't want Jesus to be their king. We know that Jesus is, is more interested in, in saving people than destroying people. John 3.17 says, God did not send his own son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So we know that Jesus' heart is not to kill these people. But they, they, are, they, are, they are people who love the darkness more than the light. And they are those who choose evil rather than good. And they are those who want to be outside of God's righteousness, righteous kingdom. And in the end, God will give them what they love. What they chosen, what they wanted to be. So, if you think life is fair, life is unfair today, because if you look at the world, evil kind of flourishes. Yeah, look at a bad people and kind of they are they are getting more blessed every single day. Yeah, and 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 you look at yourself. And, and see what wow, is hard for me and I'm a follower of Christ and it's so hard and, and these guys are, are so mean and so bad and they have success, they are so blessed, they are so rich you know and if you think well this life is kind of unfair but those people they don't have time for a relationship with the king and one day it will finish with them and one day you'll suffer your disappointments, your difficulties here will end. Because God will give each one of us what we deserve. So Palm Sunday, we 
reminds us that Jesus came first to seek and save the lost. He came to seek, to seek you, and to save you. He came to seek me and to save me. And a week later, he died. He died on a cross because you were worth dying. You were worth dying. Then he rose again and he went to the Father. He went to the Father to take what belongs to him, his kingship. And while Jesus is away, God is using us to advance his kingdom. And we all have opportunities and God called us to be faithful with these opportunities. And if you are faithful, you are blessed. And through your blessings, other people are blessed. If not, you are cursed. Your destination is hell. So my challenge is don't lose hope. There is a happy ending. God never loses. God never loses. He wins in the end. And if we are with him, we're going to win in the end. If we are under his kingship, we are going to win in the end. So live your life with expectations. Live your life with expectations that one day the king is coming. There is going to be a king. Live with that expectations. And being faithful with the work of the kingdom. The question is, are you on the winning side or on the losing side? If you are on the winning side, mark your forehead with a the W. If you are on the loser side, put an L there. It's your choice. While the king is gone, you still have a choice to be on which side you want to be. Are you going to be on the V, W, year 3, W, or on the losers? It's up to you. We are called while the king is waiting to come back. We have work to do, people. We have work to do. Amen.